أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هل يستوي الذين يعلمون والذين لا يعلمون إنما يتذكر this workshop is going to be I want everybody to draw a photograph that I've picked which I took a photograph uh, I took a photograph of a street in Toronto because I wanted to draw it uh, but I never got the chance to so I thought okay let me just take this as an opportunity to actually do something that I wanted to do um, uh, and we're gonna do that together um, and the point is to be kind to yourself don't force yourself to do anything super artsy but to just notice what's interesting to you and try to capture it to the best of your abilities now before we begin drawing i do want to ask people because i mean you can still ask me and it would be a valid question like what is the point of doing this right so let me ask you guys one question uh please respond in the chat or unmute your mic that both would be good so why do we take photographs in the first place that's my question. Why do we take photographs in the first place? Right, to capture the moment when you like something. For memories, yeah. That's a really good one, to preserve the memory, to make memories. Now, follow-up question. How many of you can recall the event that you took the photographs of? Aside from the fact that you were, aside from the fact that you felt very happy, and then you took a photograph of it, how many of you can recall the details and even the questions like why you felt happy or why that moment was particularly special? Good, good. That's very good. <laughs> Simon, you can recall. Very good. Now, the, a follow-up question to that is, why is it important to remember things anyways? This is a little bit more of a philosophical question, but I think it's worth asking. Right. We remember things to, to, yeah, to make us happy. We go back in our memory. Anybody else? When you miss somebody, you remember. Yes, it's important to remember just to see back. Those are all very good answers. Um, to me personally, I think all of those answers are really, really good. But the answer that I came to, which obviously is up to debate because it's kind of a philosophical answer. But if you don't remember, if you, for example, experience something and you don't remember it, right, or you didn't pay attention enough and your memory is unclear, it's almost as if you never experienced that event at all. Yeah, it's almost as if you were never there or you, were, you never existed in the world because you don't have any memory of it and it's possible that other people don't have memories of them. So for example, when we have family that passes away, uh, people remember them, right? And then a few generations down, the memory of it is lost. So it's almost as if that person never existed because nobody remembers them anymore, even though, I mean, obviously people have existed, right? So it's important for your own existence to acknowledge your own existence and to acknowledge the fact that you are a person who feels things and thinks things that you need to remember. But you also have to choose exactly what it is that you remember, right? So in order to do all of this, you have to be a person who's constantly aware and constantly vigilant. And this is very applicable to Islamic, um, I think, thought and philosophy because uh, one of, obviously, everybody's favorite surah, Surah Rahman, uh, Allah asks both jinns and human beings, so which of your favors of your Lord uh, will you both deny? And the appropriate response to that that is, No, our Lord, we do not deny any of your favors. And it's very easy to say this, but how many of us actually live it? Because if you don't pay attention to the favors that are being given to you, it's basically like you're denying them. You're basically saying they don't exist, even though you know that they exist. But on a very fundamental and heartfelt level, it's like, you pass through them, you don't pay attention to them, right? So this is the point of this activity. It's a very like basic activity, but I think we can get started. And if uh, we don't, nobody has to interact with each other. Uh, can everybody see the photograph, first of all, before we begin? Okay, this is awesome. So let's just begin. Everybody, uh, does everybody have a paper and a pencil in front of them? Doesn't even matter if it's blank paper. If it's lined, that's fine. I have a journal in front of me that's lined, um, and I'm just going to draw on that. So this is going to be a quiet activity, and if, ever, if, if somebody's intimidated by the fact that there's a whole bunch of people on a, a together, but we're not talking to each other. Actually, because of Corona, 
people have just started doing these like online book meetings where a bunch of people just log on to an online platform and just read books quietly without interacting with each other. So actually this kind of stuff does happen quite often. So I guess ready, said go. Just start drawing. And by the end of it, if anybody wants to share what they've drawn, it uh, doesn't matter if it's good or bad. You can do that. And it and guys, I would like to stress, really enjoy the fact that you have only this quiet activity to do. Just calm down and relax and just draw, and it's going to be great. At this point in time, you have nothing else to do but to breathe and to be calm and to draw, and that's it. It's okay if it's difficult to draw. You don't have to, it's not, like I said, it's not an art workshop. Just pay attention to the things that you like, particularly in this photograph, and try to capture them to the best of your ability. Absolutely nobody is judging you. Um, I don't think anybody here is qualified to judge. And in any case, you shouldn't open yourself up for judgment because none of us are professional artists. So if, uh, I hope everybody is doing well. I just wanted to check in very quickly. Um, if anybody has any like reflections or anything that they're noticing as they're drawing, that would be really cool to share. One of the things that I always am amazed by any time I draw one of these kinds of quick sketches is how everything seems to be in relationship with each other. So, for example, if you want to draw a building, you have to notice what the building behind it looks like. You have to know the angle at which it's at so you can try to get an accurate representation of, oh, this is where this building is located, this is where this building is located, this is how the umbrella is situated. Uh, look at the leaves of the trees. Have you ever noticed the leaves to be shaped in that particular almost arrow-like fashion and circular formation, that kind of thing? It's very, very cool. You start to notice that even in a city where a lot of people will say that there's a lot of human chaos and not the beauty of nature, there's a kind of order and a messiness at the same time, right? And when you try to sketch this sort of thing, you start noticing these different kinds of relationships that actually might just be invented in your own brain, right? There might not actually be a relationship between them, but because you are noticing it, suddenly it exists, and that's super cool. Great. Um, Michelle says she's doing good, and she was noticing the same thing, lots of proportions. Yeah, that's awesome. Iman says she hasn't drawn in a really long time, so it's coming back for her, LOL. That's great. That's great. Like me, I'm just using pencil and paper. I don't have any uh, colors with me. Um, although the reason why I took this photograph is because I really like the different shades of the building. Um, but anyways, in order to make some of the details that I like personally more apparent, I'm just shading them in black and leaving the rest in just white or plain. So that's what I'm doing. And I don't really mind if it's messy either. I am not using a ruler because I do not like rulers. But if some people like to use rulers for accuracy, that's pretty awesome too. Well, that's, I'm so glad. Michelle says it's a very cool workshop. I haven't drawn peacefully in a while. I'm just using pencil and lightly sketching. This is exactly what I was hoping it to be. Um, one of the other things I really like about this uh, photo uh, or this scene which I wanted to capture is you've got almost like three stages of buildings and a lot of layers of complexity right so for example you have um, in the middle of the city you have this tree and these little bushes which it's like nature that's forced to be there so that's a cool aspect of it the other aspect is on the right side of the photograph there's a building under construction or there's beams and things so I think they're fixing the sidewalk or they're supporting some kind of building so there's a building under construction and then there's buildings beside this construction site that look old but you know that probably these buildings are new but they've kept the old uh, outer layer of it in order because it's a better marketing strategy because they're like, oh, if people think that things are old, they're antique, they'll think that, that it's cool to visit them and they'll think that they're hipsters. And then in the background, you have like modern skyscrapers just standing, right? So there's a lot of different things going on. So there's a lot of different elements that are going on and you wouldn't really notice these things right away until you sit down and stare at it for a very long time. Sana says she also seems to be using her own understanding of buildings and umbrellas to draw them um, and she's recalling what it is like to be in such a scene. She's, and Sana says she's imagining a place somewhere in downtown. Yeah, you're sort of taken back. I actually went on a um, vacation to, uh, shortly after I read that newspaper article, uh, we went on a family vacation to Quebec and all my family members um, took photographs so that was fine, but I decided that I didn't want to take any photographs, and I just drew quick sketches. And I only made four sketches in all, even though we, we stayed over there for about 10 days. Um, but I flip through those sketches sometimes, and it takes me back in a really cool way. I really enjoy them. I enjoy looking at those sketches more than I like uh, looking at the photographs. And that's okay if I'm on D, if you're not used to drawing anymore. Actually, people have this misperception about artists. They think that 
art is something, a natural talent that you're born with, but actually it's just like any other skill. For example, cooking, most people don't like to cook. They don't want to cook, but they're forced to cook, especially women, right? And when you do a thing over and over again, it becomes a skill. It's not a talent. It's a skill, almost like a carpenter has a skill for cutting wood, fashioning wood, creating things out of wood. So people who like to do art do it more often, and that's why they're good at it. They've acquired the skill. And people who don't like to do art don't do it, so they don't have the skill. But I don't really believe that art is a talent. It's more of a passion that develops into skill. And anybody can really acquire it if you want to. You don't have to. That's okay. Stick figures are fine. Oh, good. And it's really fun, too, because you can just get lost in the details. Like, right now, I don't really even care about the bricks on the building, but for some reason, I just feel like I really have to capture them. And that's unusual from how we live our daily lives when you're trying to quickly process information and see where things are located, right? You're, like, building here, building here, building here. And then you move on because you have to quickly make decisions. You have to move on. You're trying to find places. You're trying to meet people. But when you sit down and just look at it, you're like, wow, I think I want to draw some bricks. Bricks are pretty cool. Okay, guys, uh, since there's three minutes left, um, I think we should put our pencils down, knives down, chef. Uh, but if anybody wants to say any, like, last words or say, like, I mean, share anything at all, now's the time to do it. And you can totally keep on... Uh, sketching afterwards as well. Okay, so I want to it's one o'clock. So if you want to say closing remarks or anything like that, I think I think yeah. Yeah, Jazakallah khair, bitta Fahin. It was very nice. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, I enjoyed it. Alhamdulillah, I'm very sure good. other people enjoyed it because it's been long time. <laughs> Usually, you know, nowadays, unfortunately, we are most of the time on our phones or computers or like you know watching something so it's a good it's very good alhamdulillah and alhamdulillah, i really like it when you give the reference uh, you gave the reference at the beginning of surah al-rahman mm -hmm. I, I really liked it when you connected it with that that uh, subhanallah these are all the blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know that but we don't look around we don't pay attention but uh, jazakallah khair, it was awesome alhamdulillah thank you so much it was very good, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and give barakah in your time. Ameen. Uh, so let's take a quick break for um, uh, five minutes, inshallah. You guys must be tired of sketching and drawing. So you need to stretch because you have to take notes in the second uh, workshop. And you know that, uh, inshallah, Sister Raz will finish Surah uh, Fatiha. And then we will have that quiz, inshallah. So just let's take a quick break. It's 101 right now. So we will come back at 106. Okay, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. I'll see you then. All right. Let's begin with the recitation of the Surah Al-Fatiha. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين. So we I want to do a quick recap today as well uh, like we did yesterday but I uh, I want to begin with the, actually I had added a new slide. To my presentation, which was for A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim. This is something that we always say before uh, reading anything from the Quran, and this is what we have been saying all during this uh, course as well. So, making this statement is one of the etiquettes of reading the Quran. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala Himself says in Surah An Nahl, verse number 98: When you recite the Quran, seek Allah's protection from the accursed Shaitan. When we say this statement any time we are reading the Quran, whether we say we say this statement any time that we are reading the Quran, whether we are at the beginning of a surah or in the middle of a surah, or at the end or wherever, or even if we are reciting something from memory, we have heard several times before that the shaitan is never tired of playing his tricks to distance us from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But reading these words in the Quran confirm that Allah wants us to be protected by Him. And as for everything, Allah Taala gives us the means also how to stay protected by him from him right it is not merely a possibility one must not think that uh, why would shaitan be worried about me and shaitan cannot reach me or whatever or something like that it is not merely a possibility but it is a surety that shaitan will want to keep the muslim away from reading and reciting and understanding the miracle of allah that is the quran and these words have been recommended by allah as certain protection uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. 
This is the first ayah of the Surah Al-Fatiha, the first written words that begin the Quran. At the very outset, Allah tells us that we must begin in His name as a reminder that we seek His approval in any activity. This statement is at the beginning of every surah in the Quran and while finishing one surah and beginning the next, we must make it a point to read this integral part of the book as well. This statement can also be made at any time during the day or night at the start of any task as a steady fixture in our lives to add the personal name of Allah which holds all of His attributes to be involved in the sphere of our life. We read in the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that in the seventh year of his mission, of his prophetic mission, وسلم, that the Meccan elite, the Meccan uh, chieftains, they had conspired to boycott the Prophet's clan. Wasallam, in an effort to stop him from spreading his message. And they wrote on a parchment the conditions of the boycott. It was both social as well as financial, starting with Bismillah and hung it in the Kaaba as an important declaration. As and when Allah willed, the entire parchment was eaten by termites, thus ending the boycott, except the name of Allah. Only that portion of the parchment, that small piece of the parchment on which was written Bismillah, was left uneaten by the termites within the Kaaba. This is the power of Allah's name. So we must never underestimate it. The next ayah, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. This fact introduces us to Allah that whether we are believers or non-believers. I do not say Muslim or non-Muslim purposely because that brand does not identify Allah's favor. In fact, more appropriate words even could be a worker and a slacker, right? So whether we are believers or non-believers, we are workers, we work towards our um, salvation or we are slackers. Uh, the hamd is the quality that is inherent to Allah. All the praise and gratitude belongs to the creator, the provider, administrator of all the world. I may think in my mind that the luxury that I live in now and the way my life is set for the future is all because of my intellect and decision-making abilities. But that doesn't change or affect the truth that I am what I am and I have what I have because Allah willed it to be and this is all part of a test for me. If anything, it does prove my ignorance. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Once Allah establishes His supremacy, He wants to be known further by His nature of relations and communications with His creation. That is, with immense love, care and concern. We find 99 attributes of Allah that are mentioned at appropriate times in the text of the Quran. For example, Surah Al-Imran, verse number 2, Allah says, There is no God but He, the living, the eternal. Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 54, Allah says, This is the grace of Allah which He bestows on whom He pleases. Allah is all sufficient for His creation's needs and all knowing. Surah Fatir, Verse 14, Allah says, No one can inform you about all this like the one who is all aware. And in Surah Ahzab, verse 3, al -Ahzab, Allah says, Put your trust in Allah, for Allah is your all-sufficient protector. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given importance to the attribute of affection and concern more than anger and retribution or even creation or even protection. In this third ayah, we find his, find out his association with his creation is that of tender. Maliki Yawmiddin. At the same time, he does not want us to think that anger and retribution will never happen. His next association with us is that of justice. The Quran at the very start launches the reality of the day of judgment, accountability for all actions, rewards for good, punishment for bad. In Surah Yaseen, verse number 54, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, On that day no soul will suffer the least injustice, and you shall be rewarded according to your deed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of His love and mercy before warning everyone of this difficult time. This ayah is the reader's response to the details preceding it. The ayahs 1 to 4 befit a response and Allah with His mercy and wisdom teach us the proper words that need to be said. Reading the Quran we realize the mechanism of the universe and our position in it and Allah's expectations from us.
we should question ourselves and repeat this response again and again and benefit from it ihdina siratal almustaqim being born in a muslim family does not give me a free pass through the gates of jannah the freedom of choice to obey or disobey allah is for everyone so i need to ask for direction and purpose from the same authority whom i have decided to serve for this guidance in surah al baqara verse number 2 allah says this is the book in which there is no doubt it is a guidance for the god conscious the book gives us not only information but also the method course of action the strategies of remaining on the straight and direct path okay so beginning today's class surah al ladina an amta alaihim the way of those whom you have favored we have been introduced to allah and his grandeur and we have presented ourselves as his slaves and that includes the promise to strive to our level best and rise to his expectations with his support and involvement the next step next step can only be that we ask allah subhanahu wa taala for the character and the method of those who have been successful with this responsibility and also of those who have not the quran holds gems from the past narratives of successful persons and nations those that were able to receive acceptance and rewards from allah subhanahu wa taala but also accounts of those that were unsuccessful so we ask allah subhanahu wa taala to tell us of the people that he blessed with knowledge and their achievements those that he guided and held tight right up to the end as we read from the previous ayah the guidance asked for does not limit one to the starting point of the path rather that we require a constant companion or a reminder in the form of allah and fellow muslims who take us all the way right up to the destination we should know that the path though seemingly difficult is not impossible and can be traversed with the acceptance and belief in the facts and truth at the same time if we are asking allah subhanahu wa taala to show us the ways of the achievers it also makes sense to know why and how people fail to stick to this easy and comfortable path what were the inadequacies of those that gave up isn't it that if i apply to a university i have to check all the programs that that university uh offers right the career options or the other way around that if i am interested in a specific program then i have to search all the universities that are uh, giving me an opportunity to learn that le- le- go into that program to go on a holiday i have to check which is the best spot which is the best uh, way how far is it from my house and which is the best road that i need to take the best route that will uh, make me waste least amount of time and get me at the destination and how i can enjoy my holiday right even to cook a tasty dinner one must know the right blend of spices we can't just dump everything in or just forget a few and then expect that everything should be all right right so allah taala gave us a means to make an informed decision and that means is those means are the quran right for this he sent prophets and messengers and books and some of the prophets were accepted and followed some not so easily some handful of people reached the heights of faith while some entire nations were destroyed because of their unwillingness to change their ways the last part of this ayah the first part is surah al ladina an amta alaihim so the the way the path of those uh, of the people who have been blessed by you that is the translation and over here on the slide i have written that an amta means blessing but it also means something that is soft comfortable and easy to follow and the highest blessing that allah taala can attribute to anybody is the comprehension of this religion islam subhanallah that if allah taala wants to have he, if allah taala when allah taala decides to have mercy on a family he gives them the comprehension of his religion subhanallah there are many things around us as we said before also there is so much, there are so many sources of information and especially during the pandemic there is everything is available online we don't even have to literally move out of our chairs to go to a, a specific spot a specific location and start learning something there are there's tons and tons of information sources of information and sources of knowledge around us all we have to do is take the first step forward towards allah subhanahu wa taala and then he will rush 10 step towards you that is also a hadith that if you take one step he takes 10 steps towards you if you take 10 steps he takes 100 steps towards you if you go walking to him he comes running to you right but the first step that needs to be taken as he said ihdina siratal mustaqim is the prayer that we need to make to allah that yes i am willing i have accepted you as my lord and master my creator i have accepted you as a supreme authority
Please tell me what I need to do next. And Allah Ta'ala will open multiple doors for you to reach. He does not want to hold us back. He does not want us to have a difficult life. He wants us to have a life. The, uh, he wants us to spend our life in paradise, literally. And then for that, he has he makes things very, very easy for us. So Allah has given us this means, this book, to make an informed decision. The last part of this ayah mentions two different kinds of uh, persons. And Allah Ta'ala says, Surat al-Ladina an'amta alayhim ghayr al-maghbubi alayhim so he mentions two kinds of people in the latter part of this ayah, the maghdub and the bolli. Who are the maghdub? The maghdub are the recipients of his anger and his rage, his wrath. These are the ones who have earned the anger of Allah because they did not stick to their promise of submission, of being an abd of Allah. They forgot their commitment, though they received knowledge but refused to act upon it. This is a wrong choice which is completely possible even by a person who calls themselves Muslim. And this is the point in your life when your knowledge is wasted and it becomes simply information. You cannot call it knowledge anymore. Those are the people, al maghdu al Those are the ones who are lost. Who, who are these kind of people? They are the ones who are so busy in their lives that they do not want to learn the truth lest they have to leave their comfortable life behind. They do not bother to acquire the knowledge and therefore cannot act upon it or the, all their actions are based on wrong and incomplete information. I will not call it knowledge, I will call it simply information. There is no effort from their part to learn the truth and this is perhaps the worst choice ever. And both these stages, what's scary is that both these stages are possible even for a person who has submitted himself or herself previously to Islam. There will be many obstacles, many hindrances caused by shaitan as we read before. Shaitan is a constant enemy to men and women and he causes us to forget easily. He causes us to tire easily. He causes us to question that uh, Allah Ta'ala wants me to do this but it's not letting me have too much fun. So let me just like ignore this part of the Quran and let me do what is you know relaxing for me and uh, makes me have some fun and makes me feel uplifted it's very easy for shaitan to put this doubt in our mind he distracts us with worldly priorities but the fact is that with our perseverance and our steadfastness everything becomes easier as allah is involved in it when we invoke allah and by doing so we remain steadfast in our promise to him in Surah Yusuf verse number 22, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Thus do we reward the righteous. Allah mentions rage for the ones who waste or disrespect their knowledge by, by not acting upon it. But those without knowledge are no better because Allah has been sending guidance since the beginning of time. And there is no way someone is unable to acquire it. We mentioned before that all our surroundings, all our environment are full of signs of Allah and opportunities to learn. We must raise the, we must raise the bar of our interest and intrigue to know Allah and we must raise the bar of our interest to more than ourselves and simply just look around and Allah Ta'ala speci specifically says غَيْرَ الْمَقْبُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ غير, be away from these kind of people don't be like these kind of people the al and the so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show us the technique, the mannerisms, the strategy, the attributes, the temperament of the ones that he has blessed in the past so that we can be in that same category in this time as well as in our time as well as we must always pray for our future generations as well. Because Islam neither uh, began with us nor is it going to finish with us, right? It has been there since the beginning of time. So we must pray not only for ourselves but for our future generations as well that the earth always be inhabited by people who call themselves slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also to inform us as to what can be the reason some remain or become distant or detached from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to inform us that what is the reason some remain close to Him and some become distant from Him. A casual study of the Quran reveals that ones that refuse to follow the messengers and the books and the guidance that was sent to them were only that they were too arrogant and comfortable in this life. Those are the only two things that stops them from going to uh, getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their own arrogance and their comfort in this life which they did not want to give up. And that their sight was limited to only what was in front of them and not, as I said, they did not raise the bar of their 
interest. May Allah make us from the first category and not the other two. Ameen, Ya Rabbul Alameen. The culmination of this surah, though not written in the Quran, but is known through the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, that he would say Ameen at the end of this surah. Ameen means, so be it. So when we say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطُ الَّذِينَ نَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَقْبُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَضْبَالِينَ when we say this and then we say Ameen with the thoughts in our heart that Allah should fulfill this prayer for us. The most important lesson for uh, the most important lesson to realize the most important aspect of this study of a study of the Quran or study of even not the whole Quran but even a small portion of it, a small uh, part of it. Most important lesson for us Allah has summarized in this surah, right? Accept Allah's authority, ask for it aid, and learn about the success successful and the failures, the people who were successful and the failures uh, to make the right choice. From this ayah onwards begins in the rest of the Quran, the instructions that Allah wants us to know to lead a blessed and successful life, spiritually as well as well as worldly. Allah Ta'ala, nowhere does He say that you have to leave the world if you want to be close to me. Nowhere does He say that. He says that you have to learn to create a balance between this worldly life and, the, and your spiritual life and we, we, we join both these two aspects of our life when we include Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all our worldly affairs. When we refer to the Quran according to uh, how should I go about this activity, what is written in the Quran, what, how should I start a new business, what is written in the Quran, how should I deal with people, how should I deal with my neighbors, how should I be a good parent? How can I be a good child? When we include Allah and His guidance in all our worldly affairs, that is when we can easily join these two aspects of our life, our spiritual need as well as our worldly need. If we want the answers to our question or our prayer made in this ayah, we have to read the Quran and understand the message. Knowledge is limitless. One can never say, now I know everything or it's enough, I can't understand anymore or like my brain is full of knowledge, now I can't stuff any more into it. Once you come into the comprehension and understanding, the thirst for more only increases. And the most amazing part is that Allah does not define a pre-qualification for this study. Not even that you be a Muslim, right? Anybody can read the Quran. We, we had one of those questions in the beginning, right? Anybody can read the Quran. Several instances in the Quran, Allah addresses the readers as, Ya Yuhannas, O people, listen to what I am telling you. And also He says, Ya Yuhalladina Amanu, O people of faith, listen what I am telling you. But nowhere has He made a restriction that only these people can read it and these people cannot read it. And that is the second part of Cat Stevens' story. You remember I told you about Cat Stevens on the first day. He changed his name to Yusuf Islam. I think it was sometime in the late 70s or early 80s that he reverted to Islam. And I told you that he was in the hospital uh, with a cast on his leg and he was unable to move and he was getting all bored in his hospital room. And his brother gave him a copy of the Quran, which was uh, totally in English. It did not have any Arabic in it. And he, what was it that uh, stood out to him? This is what stood out to him that in, he, I think, I believe it was Surah Al-Nisa. In the beginning, Allah Ta'ala starts Surah Al-Nisa with, by saying, Ya Yuhal, Ya Yuhannas, O people. And it's that those two words, those two words struck him, Yusuf Islam, and he said, Oh, I, saw, I thought this was a book for Muslims. I thought this was a book uh, about God and he's addressing generally every person that is going to read it. And that is what got, that's what raised the bar of his interest and his intrigue. And he read more and more and more and Alhamdulillah he reverted back to Islam. So, <laughs> I know uh, all of you might have seen the Spider-Man movies and everything and his great, his wise uncle, what does he tell Spider-Man? With power comes great responsibility, right? So when we increase our knowledge, we increase our understanding and comprehension and we increase our intrigue and our interest, then the burden of choice also increases. So we must be aware that the choice is ours and this is what, this is the right choice, this is the wrong choice, this is how I can achieve the right choice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has not kept anything hidden. Everything is open for us to understand. It's just our first step that we need to take towards this understanding. And inshallah, when you pray to Allah, Ihdina Suratul Mustaqeed, Allah will open the path to you definitely.
I would like to conclude with the words of a renowned scholar of Islam and the Quran. I quote his preface to Al-Fatiha. I, I just copied this down as uh, from his introduction of the surah. This surah is meant to create a strong desire in the heart of the reader to seek guidance from the Lord of the universe who alone can grant it. Thus, Al-Fatiha indirectly teaches that the best thing for anyone to, is to pray for guidance to the straight path, to study the Quran with a mental attitude of a seeker of to truth and to recognize the fact that the Lord of the universe is a source of all knowledge. He should therefore begin the study of the Quran with a prayer to him for guidance. From this theme, it becomes clear that the real relation between Al-Fatiha and the Quran is not that of an introduction to a book, but that of a prayer and its answer. The servant prays to Allah to show him guidance, and the master places the whole Quran before him in answer, as if to say, this is the guidance that you begged from me. Right? The volume and range of the issues in the Quran are mind-blowing. At the same time, they are very true to human nature, easily acceptable, and can be accomplished with peace which leads to a peaceful and calm life may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us on the path of true faith through it and till the end is reached may he make our hearts accepting of this message and help us move forward with enlightenment and purpose ameen ya rabbul alameen subhanakallahumma nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk jazakallah khairun kathiran thank you everyone okay so let's start Inshallah, don't just close your notes, please. <laughs> no cheating, okay? <laughs> you all are good, mashallah, because I was asking you questions and you were all uh, writing the answers. So, mashallah, that's good. So, just close your notes and, okay, let's start. You all are, most of the people are here. Okay, bismillah. Bismillah rahman rahim Okay, let's start. The first question. Who chose to play Surah Al-Fatiha in the beginning of the Qur'an? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hazrat Uthman radiallahu anh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, quickly, we have two seconds left, and the correct answer is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most people are right, alhamdulillah. Oh, okay, okay, let's go to the next question. That was very easy, very easy question. Okay, Hiba was... Good, mashallah. Good job, Iba. Okay. Second question. Scholars before us used to say that holding on to hadith is guidance, jannah, salvation, or happiness. Good, mashallah. Everybody did good. Quickly you answered. Right answer is salvation. Remember, I told you. Okay, alhamdulillah. So, Iman, mashallah, Iman is on top. So, let's go next question. Quran was revealed around 1440 years ago. Okay? So, our options, read them carefully. We read it to know the stories of the prophets. We study it for all the laws related to Islamic faith. We don't need to read such an old book. We must keep it in a Muslim house for barakah. What is the correct answer? We study it for all the laws related to Islamic faith. Good, mashallah, 11 people are correct. Okay. Yeah, it was a little confusing, yet yeah, the first one was close too. But yeah, good, mashallah. So we have, again, Iman on top. Okay, next question. Sahih al-Bukhari is a collection of around how many ahadith? 6,200, 7,000. 7500, If you are taking notes, you should know. <laughs> we have, okay, all done. 7500, yes, more than 7500. It's close, yes, good, mashallah, good job. So we have Sumaya on top, mashallah, good. Okay, girls, keep going. Next question, which words in the beginning remind us that Allah subhanahu wa blessing need to be invoked before any task? A'udhu billah, bismillah, ar-Rahman, or ar-Rahim? Very easy question. Yes, almost everybody answered. Bismillah, yes. Good, mashallah. And we have Sumayya on top again. Good, mashallah. Good job. Come on, girls. Come on, yeah. 
Next question. A person who relies only on Quran and ignore Hadith, then he is doing a serious mistake. He will go to Jannah. He has a fear of Allah. He loves the Prophet ﷺ. Which one is the right answer? Yes, 16 people right answer. He is doing a serious mistake. Yes, that's what we've learned. That Quran and Sunnah go hand in hand. And let's see who's on top. Sumaya again, mashallah. And Maryam is uh, right after her. And Iman and then Hiba and Hadia. Good, mashallah. Next question. How will Allah judge on the day of judgment? He will evaluate who had the biggest Islamic school or who had the most Islamic knowledge or who had the most taqwa or the more who made the more masajids. Two seconds left. Yes, most people are right. He he will evaluate who had the most taqwa, the most righteousness. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah, we have Sumaya. Alhamdulillah. Good, mashallah. Good. Next question. Question number eight. Prophet ﷺ left two things among us. If we hold them tight, we will not go astray. Hadith and Sada, Zakat and Hajj, Taqwa and Good Akhlaq, Quran and Sunnah. Good, good. Six seconds left. Good, mashallah. Quran and Sunnah. Yes, alhamdulillah. Yes, and we have again Sumaya on top, mashallah, good job. Next question, question number nine. Muslims need what? Only rituals to be completed, not to worry about interpersonal relations, or only kindness, affection for others, not to worry about praying, fasting, uh, to ask people to intercede on our behalf. Number four, submit wholeheartedly to Allah and follow the guidance. Yes, the fourth number. Yes, Alhamdulillah. Good, mashallah. Let's see who's there. So Maya is on the top again. Mashallah, Iman is after her right. That's good. Hiba is on third position. Mashallah, good job. Next is, how many famous books of hadith are there? You guys remember? Are there seven, six, eight, or nine? Very easy question. Did you take notes? Come on. Time is up. Six. Yes, not seven. Yeah, it was a little confusing. But the correct answer is, remember, Sihai Setta, the six books that I told you the names of. And let's see who's on top. So we have Sumaya again, mashallah, and Hiba is on second, mashallah, Iman, and then Hadi and Nabiha. Good job, mashallah. Okay, let's go quickly to the next question. Eleven number, who are the blessed people? And the choices are, ones who submit to Allah and accept and follow His guidance, the Arabs, those who read Quran, and those who met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We have two seconds left. Time is up. Yes, the first answer was those who submit to Allah and accept and follow His guidance. And let's see who's there. So we have Sumaya again, mashallah, and then Hiba and Iman and Hadiya and Nabiha. Good, mashallah. Okay. Question number 12. Hadith means a statement that describes what Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said and approved of, that describes what Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, did approved of and describe him, and that describes the relationship of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi with his wives, or that describes the conversation between Allah and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Which answer is right? Yes, number 2 and 16 people are right. Good, mashallah, good. Let's see. So Maya is still there, mashallah. Good job. Okay, let's quickly go to the next question. Okay. Maqdub and Dhalin are, we just uh, studied the, these people who are not Muslims, people who do not act upon their knowledge and are not knowledgeable, people who do not know Arabic, or people who lived before the process of time. 
who are maktub and dali just uh, before this uh, Rahat explained number two yes alhamdulillah most of you remember yeah people uh, maktub were the people who had the knowledge but they did not act upon it and dali were the people who just ignored and did not take the knowledge so let's see who's on top now Sumaya, mashallah, Sumaya, you're not leaving your place. Good, mashallah, you're consistent. Good, alhamdulillah. And Hiba is trying to push consistently and then, alhamdulillah, you'll be there, inshallah. Good, mashallah, good job, all of you. Okay, let's go to the next question. Question number 14, what is ar rab al-khali means? An empty quote, it's a question from Sira. Uh, number one answer, option, deserted area refers to the area where nations has been wiped out and no life present or people don't like to live there. What is Arab Al-Qali? Sister whom I explained. And the right answer is number two. Yeah, the, where the people, uh, the people have been wiped out, the nations, and there's no life present. Okay, and let's see who's there now. Oh, mashallah, Sumaya is still there, mashallah, mashallah, rahmat, la billah, okay, Hiba and Iman, and then Hadiya and Mishal. Okay, let's go quickly to the next question. <clears throat> Name the person who has been assigned the duties for Kaaba and the trade route. Abdul Muttalib, Abdullah, Husay bin Kilab, or Abu Talib. Four people who studied in the Sira class, who was the one? Who was the caretaker of Kaaba and the assigning the trade routes and uh, two seconds left right answer is Kusai bin Kilab and let's see who's there oh mashallah Hiba is on top and Sumaya is on second now and Iman and Hazia and Mishal mashallah good job now quickly go to the next question how many camels did Abdul Muttalib sacrifice for Abdullah None, hundred, ten, or fifty. Yeah, very, very easy question. You must have heard stories about it as well. Yes, hundred camels. Good, mashallah. Okay, let's see the people. Okay, Hiba is there, mashallah. Hadia, and then Sumaya, and Iman, and Sajid. Good, mashallah. Good. What happened, Sumaya? Come on. <laughs> okay, next question. Get ready, girls. Okay. Question number 17. Who saw the dream to dig to find the Zamzam well? Hamza radiallahu anhu, Abdul Muttalib, Abu Talib, or Abdullah? Who saw the dream that he should dig the well and find the Zamzam water? You have fish, Sister Huma mentioned it. Abdul Muttalib. Yes, the right answer is Abdul Muttalib. Okay, let's see the scores. MashaAllah. Oh, Hadia. Now, MashaAllah, Hadia is on top. Hiba is on second. Then Sumaya, Iman, and Sajal. Good, MashaAllah. Good. Keep it up. Keep it up. Good. Next question. How many sons Ismail had? 11, 10, 13, or 12? Huma, Sister Huma mentioned it in the Sira class. Ismail, he had how many sons? 11, 10, 13, or 12? We have four seconds left. Twelve is the right answer. Some people got mixed up. Yeah. Okay. That was a yeah, tricky question. And the uh, people are Hadia is on top. Mashallah. Sumaya is back on second. We have Hiba and Iman and Nabiha. Okay. We have two questions left. How many years Imam Bukhari took to complete his book Sahih al Bukhari? 17 years, 20, 16, or 18? Very easy question. Come on. I mentioned this when I was telling you about Imam Bukhari. He took how many years to complete Sahih al-Bukhari? Two seconds left. 16 years. Yes, seven people were right. Come on. You guys forgot? Or maybe you got mixed up. Okay. Yeah, it was close. Okay, alhamdulillah. Good. Now you're going to remember, inshallah. So the people who is there, Hadia, mashallah, Hadia is on top, and then Iman, and then we have Sumaya, and Sana, and Hiba. Mashallah, good. Now last question, true or false, before the revelation of Quran, the Arabs were following the Ibrahimic religion. 
Is it true or false? Before the time, before Prophet ﷺ got the prophethood, what religion Arabs were following? Abrahamic religion? Is it right or wrong? Two seconds left. Yeah, that's false. They were idol worshippers. Okay? They were not on the Ibrahim, deen of Ibrahim alayhi salam. They were following the, they were worshipping idols. And now let's see the final scores and see our winner. Number third is Sumaya, mashallah, barakallahu feek. Number two is Iman, mashallah, barakallahu feek. And number one, our winner is Hadia, mashallah, tabarakallah, mashallah, mabrook Hadia. And runners up also Sana and Nabiha. Mashallah, good job. First of all, I just like to uh, congratulate the winners and all of you. You all are winners, mashallah. Remember the hadith. Never forget that when we come here, when we are sitting uh, to learn the knowledge, we are seeking knowledge, it raises the ranks of the people. It brings us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the angels and all the uh, creations in the heaven and the earth, even the fish in the water are making dua for all of you, mashallah. You all are fortunate ones. You all are the lucky ones and the blessed ones, the chosen ones, those who are sitting here right now. Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all with more knowledge, with barakah, and shower his blessings upon you all and your families. Ameen. Jazakumullah khairan kathira on behalf of all my team and myself. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Rahat, please uh, make some short dua. Jazakumullah khairan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi Subhanallahi al-Azim Allahu Akbar kabira Walhamdulillahi kathira Wa subhanallahi bukratan wa asila Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi Adada khalqihi Wa yadha nafsihi Wa zinat arshihi Wa midada kalimati Ya Allah Please help us Use this information I will call it only information right now help us use this information that we have gathered in these three days and help us utilize it to better our lives better our thinking and better our matters that and our dealings that we have with other people this is a door that you have opened up for us and inshallah we ask your help we ask your guidance to help us go through that door and stay within that room that you have created for us Amin Ya Rabbul Alameen. I would like to use the words of Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu, his dua for, um, for to understand the Quran better. He used to say, Allah marzukni tafakkura wa tadabbura bima yatluhu lisani min kitabik. Wal fahma lahu wal ma'arifata bima'anihi wal nagura fi ajaibihi wal amala bithalika ma baqitu inna ka'ala kulli shay'in qadeer. Allahumma ya Allah, uzukni, give me the provision of the fakura to ponder upon, but the dabura and to have a deep understanding of bima yatluhu lisani, what my tongue is uttering, what my tongue is reading, min kitabik, from your book. Wal fahma lahu, and help me understand it. Wal ma'rifata bima'anihi, and make me understand its meaning. وَالنَّذَرَ فِي عَجَائِبِهِ And make me see from within, give me a sight that I can understand its wonders. وَالْعَمَلَ بِذَلِكَ And help me uh, transfer into action مَا بَقِيتُ From what is left of my life. إِنَّكَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Undeniably and without any doubt, you are able to do everything. You are able to have everything. You can make everything easy for me. You are able to have everything come to pass. Ameen, Ya Rabbul Alameen. We may not know the exact words of this dua. We may not understand the uh, Arabic right now enough to translate it. But we can all have this feeling in our hearts. And we, will, we can always pray to Allah in whatever language we are comfortable with. Ameen, Ya Rabbul Alameen. The most important thing is that we have this conviction in our hearts. We have to take the first step forward with conviction that this step is not going to, even if seemingly it feels that you are walking in the opposite direction, 
to watch all the wonders of the world that you see in front of you. But believe me, it will be a step in the right direction. Inshallah. May Allah Ta'ala help us all walk on this path and help us all remain on this path and make us all meet in Jannah, Inshallah, as the companions of the Quran. Inshallah. Ameen Ya Rabbul Alameen. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صدق الله العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته